before I thought it'd go on, it's Veterans Day tomorrow, and I hope you honor whoever's in your family. I wanted you, this is my dad, um, Harvey Shows, S-H-A-W-S. Dad was a merchant master mariner, unlimited tonnage, unlimited waters. I always said, told dad I could never equal him. Uh, I, am a, I have a terminal degree, so did dad. Um, unlimited tonnage, unlimited waters means that he could go anywhere in the world. He could steer anything. He um, did 200,000 ton uh, tankers in the Gulf of Mexico. He did the Akula submarine. He did the transport carrier, the Iwo Jima, up through New Orleans. Um, just a remarkable guy. He joined the Merchant Marines when he was 15 years old in 1942. So just think about what you could do back then. So he was in San Francisco, his brother left, and he got the lady he was staying at the boarding house to tell the recruitment person that she was his sister and that he was 16 and therefore he could join. So in the Merchant Marines, Merchant Marines are in our um, citizens who are hired by the military to move goods across the oceans. The Merchant Marines are part of the Coast Guard. They also had the most dangerous occupation during World War II. They had the highest uh, mortality rate. One out of every two injuries resulted in death because when your ship is sunk in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you have very, very few options. Um, when, when convoys would move across the oceans, they were required not to stop. And so if a ship sank, it was best of luck to the people on there. When he was 16, uh, he was off the coast of Iran in the Mediterranean when a, a German Stuka dropped a bomb on his ship and it tore a shrapnel, a piece out of his head and it opened up his skull. And he said he went temporarily nuts. Um, that's how he described it. He was telling the captain he didn't leave. He was fine. The, the cook on the ship was from Mississippi as well. And he was injured and he demanded my dad, who was 16 years old, come with him. So it was a 23 mile journey to Iran from the coastline where the hospital was. And it was in a World War I truck with no suspension. And he was bouncing up and down on this. And um, he survived because the cook held him in his arms like a baby all the way. And when the British, um, uh, the British medical doctor looked at my dad, he said, my God, we're fighting the war with children. And dad being a tough guy, he wanted to stand up for himself. He said, I'm not a kid. I'm a big boy like that. And the, the, the British doctor said, shut up, kid. You should be home with your mother. Um, so he lived, actually, he survived because of an Italian nun who, for some reason or another, took kindness on my dad and stayed by his bed for six weeks. Um, she made sure he was propped up to make sure he was surviving, got him up to, to walk, make sure he had water, and, and he survived because of that. Um, so he also was um, injured off the coast of North Carolina. Um, the North Carolina, by the way, is a graveyard for vessels in World War II where the, um, where the Germans hit them. He fell in a bat of steaming oil. He was the only one of the staff that could still do Morse code. So while he was being bandaged, he was doing Morse code so that they could get a ship to save him. So anyway, um, I just wanted to go on about this. Forgive me. Um, he survived. He was a reserve officer. Um, he um, one of the difficult things about the the Merchant Marines were they were not considered veterans, so there was no veteran benefits for them after the war. So he graduated from fifth grade, and he had no veterans benefits. They didn't have any until 1988. There's a lot of, if, if you know anything about 
armed services. There's a lot of inner conflict that happens there. And especially for them, because they thought, you're civilians, what are you doing? Ne never mind the fact that he made the Murmansk run and two thirds of the ships that were with him sank and died. So anyway, um, I just, I want you to think about the people in your family that served, um, how important they were. And, you know, they were doing it. My dad was 15. What were you doing when you were 15? I think about that all the time. Um, he was going out, risking his life. And of course, he was too young to understand what was going on, yet he did it anyway. This is when he was 17. This was two years at sea. He was wearing his uh, inner pin from the Merchant Marines. It's the first piece of clothes that he ever bought for himself. There was, when he was young, there was a girl he liked. And the family did not like that because my family comes from such poverty, you have no idea. And when, uh, in 1945, after the, just as the war was ending, after the war was ending, this was the man he was, okay? And steel blue eyes, you know, seeing four years of war, he went from a boy to a man. So he comes up to there, he's in his dress whites, he's got his combat ribbons on, and he went to that particular girl's place, and their parents melted over him, and he said, bye, I just wanted to say hello. It was kind of his way of revenge in a way, you know, that he, he did it. One more picture. Well, forgive me. Just give me a break. Um, he went on to be a captain, as I said, in the Merchant Marine. He, let's see, there's a couple of pictures that I do want to show you. Um, this was him on the paddle wheel when he was entertaining the naval officers. They got the Navy contract, so they were able to get Navy vessels um, into New Orleans. The Navy liked to come to New Orleans for some reason around Mardi Gras. So this was Dad when he was piloting the Iwo Jima, which was a helicopter transport carrier into New Orleans. You can see there's the docks, there's the French Quarter in the back. There's the captain, there's the EXO, the commanding off. I mean, the, yeah, the EXO, the executive officer, and he's pulling them in. And this is my last picture, and this is my favorite of dad. Where is it? It's here. All right, here he is. He is commanding a submarine, all right? Uh, he's commanding a submarine. That's the conning tower of the submarine. It's February in New Orleans. It's freezing cold. The wind's 30 miles an hour. And so this is my dad. He's got his walkie-talkie. He's piloting a 300-ton submarine. And he's got a cigar in his hand. And he's just living large. I, I love that picture of that. It just kind of says everything about it. The consummate professional. I got to be with him on one trip. And I learned everything about professional. Thank you, folks. All righty, I will go on now. So we had finished talking about franchise strategies and we're moving on to talk about how they generate their money. And so the important thing to realize also with franchising is they tightly govern most of their actions by a series of contracts between the franchisors and the franchisees. The contract terms usually are around 15 years. They're, they're a long distance time. So the, the contracts are set for multiple reasons. One of them to assure some kind of long-term confidence that the, that the corporations are gonna be around for a time. 
And they also help to govern, you know, all of their um, their actions within the franchising agreement. All right. So how do the franchise owners make money? Well, they can make them four ways. The first thing is the sunk costs that have to do with getting into a franchise. The sunk costs have to do with both the initial investment and then also the upfront fee that a franchisee has to pay. Now, sunk costs are one of those things if any of you ever get anything, you must ignore when you're trying to make your decisions about whether or not to get out. Um, sunk costs can be a very difficult thing to no longer wish to have or try to keep going because you've spent so much money into the <laughs> system. But in the truth is you, you must ignore it, all right? So the sunk costs, the initial way that franchisers get your initial fee to get in. The next is the royalty on sales. And this is the ultimate hostage that a franchise or post. And this is the royalty on sales is the whatever it can be from three to 15 percent of whatever a, a franchisee sale are in a given month. So as I've said before, if I make one hundred thousand dollars in sales in a given month before I even pay the light bill, I have to pay nine percent or whatever to the franchise or upstream. And so that's one of those costs that. Franchisors make money. They are many times willing to forego the upfront money. In other words, not ask for the franchise fee at all. Take a risk on things and accept a somewhat larger pay to be able to help them set up in business to keep them going. Many times, especially if... if um, the particular franchise is at a high risk of seeing this happen. The last way in which a franchisor makes money is when they buy or when the franchisees buy the inputs from the franchisor. And so once a week, you will see at the McDonald's rolling up, you will see a big McDonald's truck and it'll have the vast majority of the supplies that that McDonald's will need for the next week. It's an enormous advantage. It allows the franchisor to be a collector, to be economies of scale for all of the needs for all of the franchisees for the next week. It allows them to buy in enormous quantities and save in large sums, then sell back to the franchisee at substantial discounts and be able to also make money. Both sides will. One side will save money. The other side will make money. The other thing that it does is, is that it helps a franchisor to maintain quality because it forces the franchisee to buy from them. And that helps ultimately to maintain their brand identity. And so all of these are ways that the franchise or makes money. And these are all of the four things that a franchisee pays. Is it fair? Yeah. I mean, that is the way it is. It's the contracts you sign. That is the expectations that you should fulfill. But it's important also to understand is that there's a lot of give and take that goes on. Many times that they will, you know, look the other way from other things. Now, owning land is capital intensive. And that's one of the things that a franchisor, as I said before, McDonald's owns the land and they allow the franchisee to build on it. But it actually helps the relationship. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it also helps them with their threat. It makes it credible. So a franchisor can have the right to lease the property. It makes the termination threat credible. In other words, they can quite simply say that you're out. I think this McDonald's definitely has had some kind of change in ownership. I have no reason to know why, whether it is willing or not, no idea. But 
it is quite possible that they had a failure to be able to meet some goals and they're out for whatever reason, okay? Interestingly enough, the number two holder of property in the United States, number one being the United States itself, and number two is Walmart. I don't know if you know this, but Walmart doesn't sell their regular Walmart. When a Walmart would grow to a super Walmart, they don't allow anyone to buy that store. They maintain the property. And the reason why is they want to be able to know whoever goes in those stores. It does not want to lease that property to someone who could become their competitor. They don't want another Walmart. So they own that land. They lease their own land. Uh, but having said that, it's not Walmart's number one game. As a matter of fact, um, franchisors hate in a way to have property, but they have no other way to do business. Ask a banker. No bank wants to own land or own property. All they want to do is loan money. So this is kind of what we call the deadly embrace where you know they both have to be able to have this to have some kind of equitable way of dealing and working together. They help reduce the franchisee's capital requirements, but the franchisor can kick them out while retaining that site for someone else. It works in a very successful way. Nobody but nobody wants to terminate a franchise. It is difficult, it is costly, it is expensive. And yet such things do happen. If a franchisee is in trouble, they're probably going to get some word from the upstream partner saying you've got 90 days to try to find someone. They can sell their, their um, franchise just like any other piece of property. They can try to make a profit on it. Nothing wrong with that. But what will happen is the franchisor has what's called right of first refusal. And so what that means is they can look at who's coming in and if they don't have any confidence in them or don't want them, they can quite simply say, no, we'll match the offer and we'll buy that place ourselves. The franchisor will then impose a transfer fee, which will be used to cover the cost of find a replacement. But rarely, rarely do you see that happen. It, it's... It's got to be pretty bad. And let's just say it's probably a long time in coming when they find out. I talked about contracts several times. So what do I mean? Well, these are the things that contracts have that help Create stability and mutual kind of satisfaction. The first thing that they will do is they will make sure that their contracts are consistent regardless of who the franchise owners are. They have a single contract that has a single price, and they offer it as a take it or leave it. They don't or they don't negotiate. They don't vary the contracts over time. As I said before, usually they're 15, they can be 15 years in life. So why, I mean, basically the whole point is, is that they treat their franchisees equitably. So it doesn't matter as in a horizontal structure, whereas one dealership may be much stronger than another, you may be able to get discounts in the franchise environment. Theoretically, you don't have. It. If I own a hundred um, units, excuse me, I am treated the same as someone who owns one. But it's all right because we'll talk about multi-units, and they've got a lot of advantages anyway. 
Now, enforcement many times is looked or frowned upon because of just the difficulty that it causes to the relationship. You very much rely on influence to be able to get your franchisees to go along. They will tolerate or punish each non-compliant act. If it is something very simple, they may just avoid it altogether. Certain things, certain things, although if we're looking at sin, they're most venial. Let's say they miss a report for a Friday and they do it on Monday. Somebody's going to scratch it back. Other things like perhaps buying out of circuit rather than the exception. In other words, not buying from the uh, franchisor might get you in trouble. What you hope for is that the contracts are self-enforcing. In other words, the contracts are built with incentives that make both parties wish to be willing to negotiate together. And that cheating is not in the best interest of the company. Example, if they were to buy food, or materials outside of the normal way in which they would uh, raise money. They might find some way is that if they achieve certain sales numbers, they're given maybe some substantial discounts on the foods that they buy. But the difficulty of course is, is that every time you try to balance power, you create the possibility of imbalance. And so the difficulty with reward power is that the reward becomes expected, not the exception. So if I give my daughter a cookie after she does her homework, the next day she's going to say, I've done my homework, where's my cookie? And so, yes, contracts are vitally important. The wording must be similar and consistent amongst all of the players. You do have enforcement clauses, but the Enforcements you hope are self enforcing. And you try to ensure that cheating is not in the best interest. You get much better breaks if you come to me than if you go to someone else. I used to live in a small town in Mississippi called Columbia. It was a county seat, 7,200 people. But being a county seat, there were 35,000 people in Marion County. So during the day, there, the, the town itself would have over 20,000 people in it. They would all come to go to school. They, they're part of the county seat. They run the county governments, the lawyers, the everything, the doctors, all of those come to the county seat. And then in the day, they go home. So McDonald, excuse me. Um, Wendy's wanted to open a store there. And the difficulty was it could not find a franchise who wanted to put one there. But they wanted to put a presence there because they felt it was important, but they also wanted more control. And so this is why we come up with what's called the company store strategy. A company store is exactly what it sounds like. It's a store owned by Wendy's. It isn't a franchisee. It is a direct, almost vertical market, as you would add, as you could say, from the franchisee all the way down to that universe, that individual store. Now, to protect the brand equity of, of Wendy's, to make sure that that was run in the proper fashion, that store was a company store. And it's not unusual to see that franchises usually start with company stores. And when they've achieved a certain level of success, they become franchisees. I've always said this to me in town, the comeback shack is tailor made for franchise. And I don't know why they have, I really don't. Um, they have the right model. They have one in Myrtle Beach. It's a company store. 
They have a brand, they have a vibe. The first time they rolled the front of the window up, I just thought that was awesome. I thought that was brilliant. Well, they are made for eventually one day having a franchise attorney come in and take them over and, and do the job. I would like to see that. Not that, not that I have anything with that, but I think it's it's an opportunity to have it. And so company stores are basically where you start learning everything that you need to know that's important. So what are the reasons why? Well, a company store is a laboratory. It is a great place that if I have people in corporate that I want them to learn to be product managers or, or, or division managers, I send them to the company stores. They get their dirt under their fingernails, get an understanding of what it's like to actually work and run in them. And ultimately what they do is come back later. You can find that many people who start out corporate and go down to the company stores enjoy that life. And then basically they become franchisees as well. They become great training grounds. Many franchisers also like the, the company store because they have a greater control over those uh, areas and they can, in essence, gather knowledge that way. They can also be, um, what's the word I want to use, uh, benchmarks for other of the companies in that area so that you can know whether or not those companies in that area are doing as well as they can. And you might find they like it better that way or, or not. So, company stores become this marvelous conduit where a good town can move from one, one to the next. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't understand. Okay. I have a local store, all right? The local store can either be owned by a separate corporation, which is what a franchisee is, or the store can be owned by... Let me let me draw it. Maybe it'll make it easier. Yeah. So, so I'm the manufacturer or I'm the franchisor. And then okay, this is the franchisee. So two independent corporations that work together. All right. Two separate entities with the um, the uh, separation as far as the consumer um, is their level of independence the can, consumer can't see. But these are two actual different corporations. Okay. This company store is owned by franchisor. It's not a separate corporation. It is, think of Starbucks, okay? So Starbucks owns this conduit, all right? And so the consumer sees these two stores as being no different. They do the same things. But what this store downstream does is it has purposes for them for much, multiple reasons. They get to train many of their staff, they'll send them down to these stores so that they learn how franchises work. And when they learn enough information, they take and send them back, okay? Let's say that somebody on there gets real good and they go, you know, franchising could be my life. They can actually start their own store, okay? And then they can become a franchise. In other words, this person becomes independent. They're totally separate. They start their own corporation. And so that's what a company store is. Um, it, it becomes like a laboratory um, for testing whether or not the foods, new lines of foods come about. Um, it can help train individuals in the organizations. If I have a bunch of franchises in this area, and let's say they're all not doing good. What a company store can do 
is test their models and say, are they really doing that badly? Is there maybe something else that's going on? Maybe they're not reporting all of their sales, something like that. So it also becomes, in other words, like a benchmark to measure everyone else on, okay? Okay, good, good. So, so they, there, there are a very eclectic mix, depending on those um, the companies. Sometimes you wanna go into a location and you just wanna go and the company stores are built that way. And, and so basically what can also happen too is that the franchises can be taken back over by the company and they become company stores once again. They can also have. So, however, they live in a very synergistic way. They all have the same purposes, but of course it all just depends on who owns which. Okay. So what's the future of franchise? What is the future? Where do franchising go? How well is it successful? Well, the truth of the matter is their success rates are higher than traditional startups, but they're still there's their their failure rates are still high. If I were to look at all of the franchises put together, there's a magic line there in terms of which franchises, but below that, there's a lot of franchises that just simply don't make it. And so about three quarters of all franchise outlets that are opened up survive 10, or let, excuse me, three quarters of them don't survive up to 10 years. And so that's a basic rule. But having said that, there's a saying that success forecasts success. If you are successful, if you have churned it, if you've worked on it hard, and you've been around to come up to four years, it's almost like a magic threshold. In terms of the failure rate, once you get to that magic four-year line, it drops significantly, all right? And it goes lower. So if you're looking for a magic turning point in a franchise, it's about the eight, about four years. Because at that point, you had your baptism by fire. You've been able to learn enough to be successful and survivable, and you're able to achieve success. Now, there's another thing that you can do is if you can be successful, if you can attract a favorable rating from a third party. So we talked about Harlan Sanders when Duncan Hines came by. Duncan Hines said that chicken is excellent, it's reasonably priced, and lo and behold, before you know it, McDonald, excuse me, Kentucky Fried Chicken goes on and becomes very successful. A third party certification is a predictor of success. It helps the franchise gain an image as a legitimate player. This is what Duncan Hines did. This is the rise of the modern influencer, by the way, on YouTube. So guys like Scotty Kilmer with five and a half million people who watch them. Um, those individuals, the influencers, who with a word can say, this is a good thing or not. Now, of course, you have to be care careful of the paid shills because they're always are out there. Um, but if it's someone who's truly independent, who's truly a third party and has no affiliation between others, that can be an achievable way of, uh, a way of achieving success. So the trends in franchising, you have a high failure rate. You have survival after four years or higher. And then if you're certified by a third party, that also helps you achieve some level of success. I've talked about that there is not, there I go again. Um, you hope to have a cooperative at atmosphere. The self-enforcement is extremely important. You need to be able to motivate your partners and of course, the 
most important way for that is is to help them further their sales. Now, the problem with that is, is that in that kernel is some level of manageable conflict in that the franchiser hopes to maximize sales and the franchisee hopes to maximize profits. So what that means is, is that the franchiser hopes you make $100,000. But you would be much happier perhaps with a lower uh, lower amount of sales if you had a higher profit margin. And so what happens is, is that you'd be happier trying to find ways to trim your costs that ultimately might eat into the brand uh, a brand identity. So there's where the incongruity happens. It's not unusual for a franchiser to saturate an area with as many outlets as possible and ultimately, what it can lead is to cannibalizing from other franchises. So, um, I think one of the better examples right now is Subway. I mean, you can find Subways just about anywhere. And if I put a Subway across from a Subway that's from the other Subway, and you can see the other Subway down the foot street, you got a lot of Subways. Subway doesn't mind corporate because all of those stores are creating sales. But because they don't have fixed territories, they cannibalize on each other. Now, the ideal is that if you're wanting to open franchises, you offer those to existing franchises, or at least give them the right or first refusal before they come into your location. So is there as much in the traditional horizontal structure? Not necessarily. But is there? Yes. And so you try to find a way to get along with the partners you already have versus trying to track more that you already don't. So is there one final way of success? And the answer is yes. So, no, thank you. This is Bob or Robert Hughes. I went to school with Bobby at St. John's in Gulfport. Uh, he was in my brother's class. Um, he doesn't allow me to call him Bobby anymore. Um, he was one of the messiest people I ever knew. He never washed his football jersey for practice. By the end of the year, he could stand his practice jersey up in the corner. Um, crazy. And just think of whatever insane friend you ever had that was Bob. So, Robert, now as he's called, um, got his undergraduate degree at Southern Miss, came to North Carolina, started flipping pizzas at a Domino's. He now owns 33 of them. He's independently wealthy, and he won't return my phone calls. Okay. So um, um, I haven't talked to Bobby in a long time. And he was one of those crazy nut friends that was always there and we always had fr uh, good friends. With, I mean, he was always a good friend. So this is the example or the magic. If I was going to look at it and you wanted to get into franchising and you were going to ask me, what's the key to success in franchising? I would say follow Bobby, or Robert, excuse me, Bob. Okay? So I would follow Bobby's lead. If I was going to be successful, I would engage in the concept of multi-unit franchising. All right? Multi-unit franchising is where one corporation owns multiple locations. 
It is a multiple franchisee environment. Multi-unit franchises have enormous advantages. They can pull together their human capital. If I own 33 franchises in a given area, it allows me to take assistant store managers and move them to other locations just in case they're needed. It allows me to use all of my franchises as a breeding ground to be able to create a better set of employees and be able to move people back and forth. Not only that, but I start to have all of the advantages, the economies of scale in buying just as much as I would have had as if I were the franchisor. It reduces the job of managing hundreds of relationships for the franchisor. Instead of needing 33 project managers to manage 33 different franchises, all they need is Bob Robert, all they need is Robert, and they have one person that can manage all of those franchises together. The other thing is that all of those become training grounds. They can preserve the knowledge of all that they're doing. And then there's the power of congruity. All of those units owned by one person, they're all adjacent together. They're not cannibalizing from each other, and they're just achieving a success by that way. So I told you about, of course, Wendy's, um, his, his daughter, um, she has 26, Bobby has 33. Um, Multi-unit franchising, if you're going to find success, it is owning more than one store. And it can take you five, six years to get to that level where you can own a second store and a third store. But what happens is, is after you get past that tenure period, especially the number of new ones open up and the economies of scale start working in your favor and you achieve a broad level of success. And that's what Bobby has. And that's where franchises can as well. So if I'm going to put a cap on it, franchising is enormously successful in the United States. It's kind of almost made for, for this country. Um, it achieves certain levels of satisfaction and congruity where one side works with the other. It minimizes as much as possible the problems that you have with cannibalism, the robbing of one store from the next. And then its ultimate success is when you as a franchisee can grow to more than one location. And then you win. All right, we're done. I hope you all have a good Veterans Day. I will see you all on Tuesday when we will wrap this up. And go have a good weekend. Next Thursday on the 17th.